I believe I was paid for 22 years to work for the American people. I believe that you have the right as, as Americans in this country, as taxpayers, to know what happened. What you do with this information is completely up to you. Uh, how you deal with it is completely up to you. Uh, whether you believe me is completely up to you. But I will tell you this, what you do with it will have an effect on you the rest of your life. If you choose to ignore, the, ignore what I have to say, in time to come, you'll see that probably you should not have completely ignored what I had to say. Uh, and that's just my own opinion. Uh, but it's an opinion of an of a intelligence officer who's been out there, who's been battling in the field for the right for you to call me a liar. I think that's, this is a wonderful country when it's a country that you have the right to your own opinion. There aren't many countries out there where you can have the right to your own opinion. And I think that we need to continue uh, to protect our rights to have that opinion. Well, with the conspiracy laws, all you have to do is say something wrong to another person. Uh, and you, you've lost that right. You're then a felon. I'm a felon. I left federal prison April 4th of this year. And what I'd like to do now is tell you what happened to me, how it happened to me, so that maybe you can learn from it and avoid some of the pitfalls. In 1985, I was tasked with infiltrating a unit at Fort Stewart, Georgia. The unit was a medevac unit. In the military, there are uh, taskings are made far in advance on who's going to support certain activities. The Nicaraguan Revolution was well underway. Uh, the Boland Act was in place, and the Boland Act uh, did not allow for U.S. elements to support the uh, revolution in Nicaragua. Uh, the only way the United States government could support those were in uh, humanitarian efforts. So as a medevac helicopter pilot, uh, I would be able to support whatever the intelligence needs were posing as that medevac helicopter pilot. So I was tasked to infiltrate the third of the 498th Med Company in Fort Stewart, Georgia, who would soon be getting a tasking to go to Honduras. I soon found myself in a place called Pomerola, Honduras, with a U.S. Army crew. Uh, I was the only uh, intelligence officer on that crew. Uh, the crew consisted of uh, two aircraft and two crews. Uh, I was the executive officer of that. Uh, we had a, uh, a ranking uh, military officer with us who was actually the officer in charge of the contingency. Um, on February 26th, I was flying uh, two pilots from Ilopango Air Base uh, into the Contra camps. Uh, one of them in particular was El Paraiso. Uh, they were to arrange arms drops being done by a third entity, a company called Corporate Air Services. Uh, this Corporate Air Services uh, employed several pilots from the old days uh, who were somehow attached to ex-intelligence agencies. Uh, some of them were even old Air America pilots. So uh, you can imagine who might be the actual owner of corporate air services. Uh, this was the group uh, and part of the group uh, that was owned by Ollie North's Enterprise. Um, you would find in 1986 these two pilots that I flew uh, on February 26, 1985 were killed in a plane crash over Nicaragua. Eugene Hossenfuss survived that crash and was subsequently captured by the Nicaraguan government and sent back to the United States. On that day in February 26, 1985, uh, after picking up uh, Mr. Cooper and Mr. Sawyer, the pilots, from their meeting in El Pariso. Uh, they came out of the meeting and they had uh, a cooler marked vaccine. The cooler was a large uh, cooler, uh, probably about a 96 or 100 quart size, if you understand uh, the sizes of coolers, very large, commercial grade. Uh, it was sealed and it was marked vaccine. We put it on board the aircraft. We flew all of them to La Mesa, Honduras. Uh, the two pilots were scheduled to catch a flight back to El Salvador. Uh, the cooler was destined for Panama to a Dr. Harari. Uh, I, was, I was given instructions to pass it on to a U.S. Air Force C-130 that was uh, landing there 
sometime within the next few hours. Uh, when we unloaded the cooler from the aircraft, it, the seal broke on it. Uh, it popped open. Uh, I think that probably the hard landing that I had uh, and bounced it around inside the aircraft on that particular occasion on a very hot day uh, helped aid in breaking that seal. Um, but when the seal broke, we found uh, a large quantity of bricks wrapped in a blue medical tape. Uh, we opened it up. I put my finger across the powdery substance, crystalline type powder, put it on my tongue, and it immediately numbed my tongue. Uh, previous experience told me that this was cocaine. Uh, and estimating the amount of cocaine in, on, inside that cooler it was over 100 kilos of cocaine. I asked the pilot who it was going to, and he said in, in uh, Honduras or in Panama, it was going to a man called Dr. Harari. Uh, Dr. Harari, I would find out later, was actually Mike Harari, a Mossad agent assigned to General Manuel Noriega as a confidant. <clears throat> Upon arriving back at Pomerol Air Base, I immediately went into our secure lines. I called Washington Switch, and I advised them, uh, the, my controller at Washington Switch, uh, what I had found. My controller, uh, a man codenamed Jake that I'd met in earlier years in Task Force 160 was actually Ollie, Ollie North. Uh, Mr. North told me that um, it was evidence that the Sandinistas were dealing in cocaine. The Contras had confiscated it during a battle from the Sandinista government and it was destined for world courts, for the warehouses and to be used as evidence in world courts against the Sandinista government. Uh, during my time in Honduras Probably eight tons of uh, medical supplies in a light powder and a crystalline, two different substances, were flown by my medical aircraft. Uh, always marked medical supplies of some sort and normally delivered to waiting C-130s or uh, civilian C-123s or DC-3s in the area of operations. On one particular occasion, following my initial find, uh, I had an engine failure. During the auto rotation process, the blades on my aircraft had been put into a negative pitch position so that it would not auto rotate correctly. Uh, after landing and having the maintenance officer look at the aircraft, uh, we did survive the landing. Uh, it did damage the aircraft. Uh, but Mr. Cooper, our maintenance officer, looked at it and said, It's amazing that you guys survived. These blades are completely negative pitch. They should never have uh, rotated on their own. They should have gone into a counter rotation and dropped you out of the sky like a dipsy dumpster. Fortunately, uh, having aviation skills that I have, and that's what I do for a living, I can fly an aircraft under any radar anywhere. That's my forte. Uh, that's why I was, I was chosen for this, and that's how I was chosen to be used in the intelligence community uh, throughout my career. Having survived that, we knew that there were some problems. So on the back of our flight plans, I would normally try to cover ourselves and uh, provide insurance for what was going on. Uh, my passengers were written on the back of the flight plan after I landed. The cargo that we found on board the aircraft were written on the back of the flight plans uh, after I landed. And anything having to do with the mission that was of interest were written on the back of the flight plans after I landed. This was all done at base operations where the flight plans were filed at Pomerola Air Base in Honduras. During this three-month period, we, we collected a number of documents uh, in both flight plans, mission briefs, and uh, mission uh, uh, air, air evac uh, medical reports uh, that we made these notes on. Um, it's interesting that they aren't just my notes. I did have crew members who can corroborate most of what I have to say. Uh, they remember the instance as well. So you developed insurance, in other words? We, we developed a, an insurance policy in that manner. Uh, and in later years, I found that I would have to develop even a greater insurance policy. Uh, the people I worked for, the people I flew, uh, are all on these flight plans uh, for this three to four month period. Uh, they were filed with base operations, and uh, a very trusted Honduran government official kept those in, in uh, his chain of custody so that they were protected through the years. Uh, in 1995, I went back to Honduras, and I collected these documents uh, after a threat from Ali North to give up the documents or else. I knew that to give him the documents wasn't going to work. 
uh, <laughs> I knew where I'd end up if I gave him the documents. So in lieu of that, I went back to Honduras. I took my wife. Uh, we flew into Honduras. We were followed. Uh, when we landed in Belize first, uh, I, I knew that we were being followed at that point. Uh, I was able to um, evade the person who was assigned to follow us so that I could meet with the person who had these documents. He gave me certified copies of the documents, and we returned to the U.S. Within two weeks of returning to the United States, I was arrested by the FBI uh, and placed in prison. But let me tell you even a little more about the instances that followed my arrest.